I have the pleasure of introducing Lisa Taylor, our next speaker. And uh, when, I, when I had a chance to connect with Lisa before we started tonight, uh, we both commiserated about um, one thing we had in common, and that's uh, that we both have uh, a teenager or two in the house. I have two, she has one, and a, a 14-year-old and an 11-year-old. Um, and we thought, you know, there might be a really nice connection to the idea of truth. Uh, and teenagers. Um, in particular, are they really telling us the truth? Uh, and I can tell you, I'm not going to get into that because it'll just get back to my son and my daughter. But I am grateful for that quick connection uh, prior to. And uh, I know that uh, you're all going to enjoy hearing from Lisa. Lisa is a true trailblazer. She is the president and founder of The Challenge Factory, and she's intent on challenging outdated career thinking. She understands how demo demographics are driving strategic changes to today's workplaces, and her company, The Challenge Factory, tackles almost every aspect of the issue with real-world solutions. She is a sought-after speaker and columnist. She was uh, working with the federal government uh, just today, coming back from Ottawa. And she is the go-to resource for helping companies, and it sounds like the government, uh, for helping to adapt to career, uh, changing career timelines and demographic composition. Uh, her clients and audiences continually rely on her insights, and she's been asked by such uh, uh, companies and publishers as the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, Sun Media, CBC, Zoomers Media, Rogers, and tonight, Talk Boutique. Uh, we are thrilled to have uh, join us on the stage here, Lisa Taylor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so I am not going to talk about my teenagers, but I am going to talk about my husband. So a few years ago, it was uh, his birthday. And he woke up and he turned and he looked at me and he said, you know, I feel great. I've really been worried about this birthday for a long time. I thought I was going to feel awful. I thought it was going to be this big deal, but this is no big deal. I feel amazing. You know, 35 is really not that hard. And I thought to myself, 35, really? He's been having anxiety leading up. I didn't even know that this was a big deal to him as he had been leading into this big birthday, big birthday. So I said to him, well, I'm glad. I mean, on your birthday, you should feel good. It's great that this is getting off to a really good start, but I have a piece of news to share with you. You're only 34. <laughs> Somewhere along the way, he'd lost track, and he'd had weeks of anxiety leading up to this milestone birthday that was a birthday, but it certainly wasn't a milestone. And he looked at me with this sense of wonder on his face. I'll never forget the look, and I don't think I could do anything ever in our relationship to replicate it, where he said, you have just given me the greatest birthday present anyone could ever get. You've given me a whole extra year of life. Now, I wish I could tell you that with this whole extra year of life, he started a nonprofit that changed the world, or he formed some formulation that cured some kind of disease that really needed. But that's actually not the truth. What's true is 34 is like 35, is like 36. He went to work, he came home, he played with the kids, he did stuff around the house, he mowed the lawn, and the year went by. But what was so interesting to me about the story and why it stays with me all these years later is because by nature my husband's a pessimist. And people have misunderstandings of what pessimists are like. He's not an unhappy person, he's just a pessimist and that's just a different point of view. So for him to have this amazing, optimistic, aha moment on the, birthday, on the morning of his 35th birthday was really quite extraordinary. And what he believed to be true had shaped that optimism even though it wasn't actually true at all. So let's do a little bit of a test here. I'm going to toss out a couple of statements. You tell me what you think the truth is. I'm going to give you two options, so you can weigh in on one option or on the other. Okay, two people go into a job interview. One is a former colonel in the Canadian Forces. The other is a senior manager in a call center. Between those two people, which one of them presents at the interview in a more direct, more commanding, more directive, more dominant, more aggressive way? 
Who thinks it's the former colonel in the military? Who thinks it's the call center? Who's not answering because they think it's a trick question? <laughs> OK, fair enough. Let's do another. Which generation in the workforce today is the most disruptive, is actually changing the world of work? Who thinks it's millennials? Who thinks it's boomers? Who even remembers there's a Gen, Z, a Gen, a Gen X in the middle? <laughs> OK. And one more. How old are you when it is too old for you to change your career? At what point do you hit a plateau that actually it's extraordinarily dif difficult and you can't move past that point? How old is that? Toss out a number. Let me hear a couple. When you're in the ground. I love it. What else? 50. OK, 50. I heard 80 over here. I heard 70 over here. OK. So, um, if you want to know what's actually true, the fact about those things, you can find me afterwards. And I'll, I'll share a little more about each of those pieces. But I will dig into the last one now. I'll, I'll, we'll go into that one in more detail. So when the retirement age was set at 65, life expectancy was, anyone know? 62. So life expectancy is set at 65. Uh, sorry, retirement is set at 65, life expectancy is 62, it was 1935, it was enacted for Social Security so that the aged could stop working to conclude their affairs. The dictionary definition of the word retire means to conclude, to withdraw. You retire to bed in the evening. You don't say, I'm going to go retire to a party. Since that time, we've moved ahead, and we don't have a 62-year life expectancy now. Now we have an 83-year life expectancy. But along the way, we've lost a bit of truth. Our working life expectancy is frozen as if we're still in the 30s. We still act and treat and have systems and structures and workplaces and government policy that believes that we should be treating 65-year-olds as if they're aged. You're not aged at 65. Aged comes into play when you're within months, if not a year or two, of end of life expectancy. And this causes all kinds of dysfunction. It causes dysfunction at a policy level that allows us to think that it's OK for our citizens to be non-productive for a quarter of their lifespan. It causes problems in companies that create talent structures that don't recognize that some of the most innovative, productive years, the ones that are actually truly transforming the way work is done, the fastest growing demographic of entrepreneurs in our country, is over the age of 55. And it causes individuals to feel uncomfortable about themselves, to feel this weird tension between what they know to be true and the truth that they're living. And so they say things like, 60 is the new 40. I can tell you, and this often does not go well, so I'm going to step back a little bit. 60 is not the new 40. 60 is 60. 40 is 40. I can tell you as someone in their early 40s, there isn't a 60-year-old on the planet that wants to deal with the teenagers and the work and the dishes and the... <laughs> Nobody wants to go back to that. But what is true is that 60 doesn't feel the way we think 60 should, because you're not aged. So that, comes, that brings us to a really interesting point. What happens, or what's the difference between truth and what is true? And how do these things actually start to come together? So in my work as a researcher, I work across a number of different disciplines in all different industries and sectors. I happened to be with the military earlier today uh, in Ottawa. And one of the tools, one of the disciplines, one of the areas that I always use to go back to is actually science. Science exists for only two purposes. It's fascinating. It exists to control, and, exi and it exists to predict. That's it. So in my work as a workforce demographic person, as well as a futurist looking at the future of work in 2020, 2030, 2040, how do organizations get ready for the changing nature of work? We can look to science to help us solve some of the issues that we're facing. Our clients will say to us, we can't even predict what's happening next quarter. How can you possibly tell me what the workforce is going to look like in 2040 and how we can prepare for it? 
Well, if we know what to control for and we know how to predict, we can start ourselves down that path. On my team, we have a scientist in residence. She's a gerontologist and a psychologist, which basically means she can do psychology and neuroscience, brain science stuff from age 18 all the way through till 100. And she reminds us almost every day that there's two ways that you can look at life. Life can either be a puzzle, where you start with the edges and you get the framework so you know exactly where the boundaries of that puzzle is, and then you go about finding the pieces, they fit perfectly together, and when every piece is in place, you see the picture and you get the sense of accomplishment because you've solved it. Or life can be a mystery. With life as a mystery, what you're left with are not pieces to assemble, but clues to find. And sometimes they're in unexpected places. And sometimes they don't seem like they fit. And some parts of the mystery actually never get solved as you work your way towards solving as much of it as you can while it continues to change on you. Traditional business training teaches us to think about the puzzle. And science teaches us to explore the mystery. So let me take you through a story. A couple of weeks ago, I was with a group of women, accomplished, senior, you would know their names. They've been accomplished in the areas of politics, they've led businesses, they've transformed technology, they're economists. They were sitting around a table, we were having a future-looking discussion about geopolitical issues. So they were discussing markets in Asia and Brexit and, of course, Donald Trump. So as the conversation was unfolding, one of them leaned across the table and said, you know, I've lost my optimism. And the rest of the table leaned in and said, yeah, I know what you mean. So there I was, sitting with these women who, over the course of their lifetimes, have transformed the hard stuff. I mean, they've come up against all kinds of people in politics and business issues, and they're all sitting around commiserating that they've lost their optimism. Now, it would be easy to say, well, that makes sense. Here's the puzzle of Donald Trump, and they're women, and he it's not so great for women, and so we'll put the pieces together, and that must be the explanation. But instead, I turned to science. We went back to the office and dug into what do we learn from psychology and gerontology? Why would, what happens when people say that they've lost their optimism? And in fact, what we know is a loss of optimism is often tied to legacy. And what we know about legacy is the way that you uncover how you see your own legacy playing out is to actually go back and look one generation before you. So one of our researchers comes from India. Her family, her parents, went through incredible hardship. They had to flee their home. Every step of the way, something would go wrong. And in every step, as they settled and resettled and resettled and resettled, there was always someone who emerged Someone who stepped forward in a hero role that just at the right time gave them the information they needed, the kind hand that they needed, uh, you know, some money that they needed, a job that they needed. Along the way, even when things looked dire, there was always a hero figure that emerged. And to her, the sense of what happens when she loses her optimism is always a momentary fleeting moment because she knows the hero figure will reemerge again. And maybe that would even be her that maybe it's her legacy to be that hero figure and step into that. So what happens if your family generation, one generation back, doesn't have that hero figure? What happens if your family history, one generation back, when democratic institutions are challenged, went through a time when there was no help and light, when there was no redemption that was being sought anywhere and there was no help coming for the members of your family? What happens when that's the one generation back impact on your legacy and you lose your optimism and you say, what's it all been for? I've worked so hard to move our society forward over the course of my lifetime and all that I see is a complete return to where we've been. Now what do I do? What we believe to be true affects our sense of optimism. And the clues for what this means are not just easy facts that are easy to find and accessible in mainstream media. There's actual methodology, approaches, science, techniques to be able to learn what's the difference between our personal truth 
and what is actually true. And there are ways for us to regain our optimism. So whether it's dealing with Donald Trump and politics, or whether it's taking a look at your own work and career and pattern within your company, or whether it's how you're gonna deal with a non-milestone birthday, if we take, stop and take a look, we analyze what's actually true and what's just my truth, we search for clues and not easy pieces to a puzzle, we're then able to create, define, and step into living the legacy that we want, not just worrying about what we leave behind. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Lisa. Incredible. Um, uh, bravo. Bravo. Well done.